Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our midweek Lenten service for this evening. Tonight, we examine the parable of the leaven, and to start out our worship, we see hymn number 773, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Hymn number 773, in the back of your worship. St. John's Lutheran Church, this is Precious Lord, Take My Hand, it was written by Thomas Dorsey, who wrote gospel hymns, wonderful gospel hymn writer. And this is appropriate for Lent. This is the uh, 24th of February. And we're in Lent now. This is our midweek service. Therefore, declare to the entire forgiveness of all your sins 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seen. reading from the fifth chapter of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and true. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. In a reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter, glory, glory to you, O Lord. Lord. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive, do you not remember the five loaves for the five thousand and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. A couple of announcements to share with you uh, before we sing our next hymn, which will be hymn number 803, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. First of all, as you may have heard, <coughs> or may not have, our sister Dolores Smithman was called from the church militant to the church triumphant this morning at 7 a.m. Visitation will be Friday from 4 to 7 at Jackson Lytle Funeral Home. Then on Saturday morning from 9.30 to 10 will be visitation here in the church. And then the service will begin at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary. And there will be a luncheon after the return from the cemetery. So. Please remember uh, the Mittman family in your prayers and your acts of condolences. And the other announcement is next week we will look at the parable of the unmerciful servant, uh, which is Matthew 18, 23 to 25. But now let us sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, hymn number 803, in the back of your worship. This hymn was written by Isaac Watts the father of English hymnology, who wrote hundreds of hymns. He started when he was only 18 years old. He knew Latin and Greek. These are very beautiful poems set to music, written in the 1700s, Isaac Watts.
It is hard to comprehend how in life something small can have a major impact on something much larger. Such as one rotten apple destroying the whole bush. Or when you go into the realm of sports, you oftentimes hear about a team that showed great promise for the upcoming season and was picked to be a championship team. And they end up having a terrible season. And after the end of the season, word comes out how there was one player who was a cancer in the locker room, as they refer to it. One player who disrupted the whole rest of the team, disrupted the whole functioning of that team, and kept them from being successful. Or how you can have one person in a group of kids be bad, and instead of the goodness of the other kids influencing him, his bad influences all of them, so they end up turning up and doing things that they normally would not have done and know they shouldn't have done. One little bit of corruption, one little bit of evil, one little bit of uh, un uh, inappropriate behavior can ruin an entire community. When Gina and I were married, she was hired by a certain women's chain to become manager of their store in the Springfield Mall. And the story on this store was that even though the stores around it did very well, this store was about the worst store in this certain chain's uh, list of stores or group of stores. And so they wanted Gina to go in and see if she couldn't turn the store around. So Gina started working at this store and after just a couple of days, she soon realized what the problem was. The problem was one or two workers who were not on the same page with everybody else. One or two who did everything against the company policy, everything against Gina's rules and regulations, everything against the store's rules and regulations. And so Gina could see how this was causing the low morale in the store and its lack of effectiveness. She got rid of those two people just like taking the rotten apple and throwing it out of the bushel so it doesn't spoil the other. And within uh, several months, that store which had been in the bottom of her district was now the one, number one store in the district of that retail chain she was serving. Just one rotten person, just one little bit of corruption, just one little evil thing can destroy something much larger. It can destroy a family, it can destroy a community, it can destroy a congregation, it can destroy a denomination, it can destroy a nation. And so we have to be careful about the evil and corruption that tries to creep in and destroy that which is good. And it is no different in our life of faith. In our life of faith, it is important that we do not allow little corruptive influences, little false doctrines, or little false teachings to creep in that seem really harmless, and you look at me, and, oh, it won't hurt if we study this, or it won't hurt if we kind of believe that. And then suddenly you wake up one day and your entire belief system has been destroyed. And your entire faith has been shattered because now you don't know what to believe because of that evil influence. This is what we have today in our gospel lesson. Before what I read in that 16th chapter, back in the 15th chapter, Jesus had fed the 4,000. He then had been confronted by a group of Pharisees and Sadducees. They wanted a sign for him to perform a sign from heaven to prove that he was really who he was. And Jesus refuses. He tells them that they are an evil, corrupt generation. The only sign that he will give them is the sign of Jonah. And of course, that sign of Jonah meant that Jesus was saying that he was going to die and then on the third day rise from the dead, just like Jonah had been swallowed into the belly of the great fish and then on the third day spit him back up on land in order to finish his task of preaching to the city of Nineveh. 
So now he and the disciples have gotten into the boat and they're sailing across the sea. And Jesus says these words to them after they get in the boat, the disciples realize they haven't brought any bread to eat. And Jesus says in verse 6, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And of course, like happens so often with Jesus and his disciples, Jesus is talking about one thing, and they've got their minds focused on something else. I'm sure you can figure it out. Jesus is talking about the spiritual. Jesus is talking about our relationship with God. Jesus is talking about that which is most important in life. Those things that are eternal. And here they're thinking about their stomachs. Gosh, we didn't bring any bread with us. We got to go all the way across the other side of the lake and we have nothing to eat. And we're going to be in Gentile country, so we can't buy the bread from the Gentiles because that bread is unclean. And as a Jew, we can't eat Gentile food. And yet, that's not what Jesus is talking to them about. He's not talking to them about their stomachs. He's not saying that he's hungry and he wants some bread. He is talking about this danger of a little bit of false teaching or false doctrine destroying the road to salvation. In the Old and New Testament, for the majority of time, Leaven is a symbol of evil. Leaven is used to designate evil. It's used to designate corruption. It's used to uh, designate false doctrine. It's used to describe that which distracts you from the truth about God and your relationship to God. It refers to those things that are disgraceful. Once or twice, leaven is used positively. <laughs> like an example where Jesus tells us we're to be like leaven to society. That we're small compared to the world, but we're to flavor the whole world with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here, of course, he's using it in a negative sense. He's saying, beware of the false doctrine and false teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And it just goes right over the disciples' heads. They're not thinking. So he has to go on and explain it to them. He talks about, don't, don't you remember that I fed 5,000 people. Now I've just fed 4,000 people. I've always been able to provide for our physical needs. We're not talking physical, we're talking spiritual. We're talking that which must be guarded and watched closely. And that that must be watched closely is the gospel of salvation. The Pharisees and the Sadducees both had their ways of twisting Judaism from what God had intended when he called Abraham to go from Ur the Chaldees to the Promised Land, from what God had in mind when he called Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, when he called Moses uh, to go and free his people from bondage in Egypt, when they met at Mount Sinai and the covenant was made. The covenant was based on faith. A faith in God that God would be their God. He would be their people. They would be his people. And they would have faith in him providing for them and protecting them just as he had done in freeing them out of bondage in Egypt. But as the years passed, this, what was supposed to be a faith because of the Sadducees and the Pharisees turned into a religion. A religion no longer based on faith and where your heart was, but was based on outward things and outward action. But the Sadducees and the Pharisees had two different ways of going about it because they were two different, made up of two different peoples. The Sadducees, they were the least liked by the normal Jewish people. They were the aristocrats. They were the, if Israel had, had a royalty, they would have all been the barons and the dukes and the princes and so forth of, of Israel. They were all rich aristocrats and very political. They also were people from whom the high priests were drawn from and uh, the other priests. 
They saw, because of the Roman occupation, they saw their religion as being a political tool for political action. Much like we see today with people with the church today who want to turn the church not into the proclaimer of the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ, that sinners are saved by Jesus' death on the cross and by his resurrection and ascension, but they want to use the church to bring about political goals. The reality is the gospel is not pro-communist, it's not pro-socialist, it's not pro-democrat, it's not pro-republican, it's not pro-independent. The gospel is the gospel of salvation for the world. Politics has nothing to do with it. But we see churches today who make their church into a political force instead of a spiritual force. And in so doing, they are eating of the leaven of the Sadducees. When the churches become so political that they're telling you who to vote for and what you have to uh, believe on a certain social issue or how you must stand, then the church is getting out of its rank. It's playing on the wrong field. What did Jesus say when asked about politics? He said, render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God the things that are God's. He made that distinction. In Lutheranism, historically, the doctrine of the two kingdoms, as a Christian, we are a citizen of the state in which we live and are to be obedient to the state as long as it does not ask us to, to do anything contrary to God's will. And at the same time, we're a citizen of the church, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, an heir to all that Christ has won for us through his suffering and death on the cross. And we live in both worlds simultaneously. The, it is, the church does influence our actions. It can influence our political thought, but it's not to be a political force. It's to be a faith. A faith that believes totally and completely in Jesus Christ and who he says he is and that what he says he did for our behalf is true and that is the only way for us to have salvation by clinging to his cross by believing that his death on that cross does indeed pay the debt of sin that we have that sinners we're all sinners and therefore we all need salvation and Christ is the only one who can give us that salvation. So that is 11 of the Sadducees. The Pharisees, now they were more popular with the common people in, in Judaism because they tended to be a little more benevolent and, and do things for the common people. But they, their leaven was caught up in outward show. They were the ones who pushed rules and regulations, outward ritual and outward purity. They were the ones who pushed works righteousness. They were the ones who brought about legalism. And unfortunately in the church today, we see some denominations within the Christian faith falling back in that old trap of legalism, of outward purity, of outward ritual, of uh, believing in works righteousness being their salvation, even though they don't claim they believe that. They will say they believe that Jesus Christ is the way of salvation, but then they will also, in their church, give you all kinds of rules and regulations about what you can and cannot do. And of course, those of you who grew up like I did, and grew up around these churches, always found it a shock when you went to PE class and you had a classmate that couldn't put on a PE uniform because according to their church, that was disgraceful. Or they couldn't be on the basketball team because the shorts were too short and the jersey was too revealing, and so they couldn't play on the basketball team. Or you would invite them to go swimming with you down at the public swimming pool or to drive a few miles out of Louisville to, to a lake to, and you'd go to a beach in a lake, and they couldn't go because it was against their church's rules and regulations to go swimming. So that's legalism. That has nothing to do with your salvation. 
Whether you go swimming or not doesn't determine whether you're going to heaven or hell. But that's Pharisaic faith. That's a Pharisaic Christianity. And unfortunately, as I said, it's alive and well today in America in 2016. So this is why these words of Jesus are as relevant today as they were then. Beware of the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Beware of that false doctrine. Beware of that false teaching that creeps in and everybody kind of winks at it. And then before you know it, you have been seduced into the Pharisee or Sadducee camp and fallen out of the true camp of faith in Christ alone, grace alone, word alone. And so we have to be careful of this false teaching and of this false doctrine. And we see it also today among some of those who are very popular. Among some of those who sell thousands of books and are on TV and appear on the Tonight Show and the, whatever the new Letterman, old Letterman show is now called and all those other kind of talk shows, you know, they appear on there as, as guests and everybody fawns all over them. Yet when you listen to them or you read their books and you hear something about you have this power to do this and God gave you this power to do that and it has nothing to do about the power of the Holy Spirit to enable you to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit giving you the power to forgive someone who has hurt you. If it's telling you that the Holy Spirit is giving you the power to get rich or to be successful in business or to be that athlete you always wanted to be, you are hearing false doctrine and false teaching. But people are lapping it up. Because as a church, too often we have not stood up loud enough and said that is the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That is just that little bit of corruption, that little bit of evil that gets in and it spoils the whole of it, the whole loaf, the whole island. And so we have to be on guard against any kind of false teaching or false doctrine trying to enter into the church. And again, just because somebody is popular does not mean they're correct. St. Peter, or St. Paul, warned Timothy that the day would come when people would have itching ears and they would be searching out those preachers who only told them what they wanted to hear not what Jesus said. And what is it we hear oftentimes that people don't want to hear today? They don't want to hear they're a sinner. They don't want to hear that they're a sinner and that they need salvation and that they cannot be good on their own, that they are not magnificent on their own, that they're not wonderful on their own before God, but before God they are a sinner in the hands of an angry God worthy of condemnation. And it is only through faith in Jesus Christ that that changes from being that sinner in the hands of an angry God to being that child of the Heavenly Father and heir to the kingdom and all that Jesus Christ is preparing for us. So we have to beware of that level. We cannot let it sneak in. I can remember hearing that after the merger of the LCA and the ALC and the ELC to form the ELCA, which we now have, my first contact uh, with ALC pastors who had gone to the ALC seminary in Columbus before Hama had merged with it to form what's now Trinity back uh, when I was in seminary. It was Lutheran School of uh, Theology in Columbus, and, then, uh, and that was the ALC seminary. And they would all talk about this one professor <coughs> His name was Fent, uh, F-E-N-D-T, little German professor, or little professor, I should say, from Germany. And his one question all the time when it came up to graduation to each member of the senior class when he would talk with the other faculty about whether or not the student would be approved or not, his one question was, but do they know the catechism? That was his concern that they knew Luther's catechism from front to back 
and back to front. Because if they did, they would not be then would not have to worry about sending a person in the parish who was going to bring in some leaven of the Pharisees or Sadducees. They would be speaking the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So we must be aware because that little corruption can destroy an entire church. Last night, our, my nephew Coleman, you know, the uh, Green Beret who has preached, I'm not sure I've kept you up to date, but Coleman is now in a reserve unit so that he can go to seminary. He's in his first year seminary at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Uh, and he was, uh, he, like I said, he came up to and surprised Gene and me last night. And so we uh, got to have supper with him and I got to talk to him about school. And he brought up something that really surprised me, especially since he's going to Missouri Synod Seminary. Uh, and, he, and that complaint was that in the four years of schooling he has to have, he only has to take or will only have two courses on preaching. But he'll have all these other courses, five, six, eight courses on some other thing. He started naming some of these things that, that he would have to have uh, in order to graduate. And I told him, I said, Coleman, I said, I don't want you to get in trouble with your seminary by me. I don't want you to go through, graduate, get ordained, become a chaplain in the army, you know, fulfill your dream. I said, but those courses, they're, tell, they're piling up on you. I said, those are worthless for the parish and even more worthless for being a chaplain from what I understand being a chaplain in the military is like having had a couple of good friends who have been chaplain, one was in the Air Force and the other was in the Army. I said, you need to tell me you need more preaching classes because that is where we confront the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The first line of defense is the pulpit. The second line of defense is Sunday school. Third line of defense is Bible study, whether group or on, uh, people in the congregation or people in your neighborhood or how you have a Bible study. The fourth <coughs> line of defense, excuse me, is your own study of the Bible. So we need this emphasis on the Word. We have to abide in the Word. That little pinch of evil and corruption will enter into the church and then the whole church will come crashing down. As a church forgets that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone because of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his suffering on that cross. Because of his willingness to give his life up to the for our Salvation and to then give himself back to his heavenly father once all had been complete. <clears throat> and so we must be on guard. In, chapter, in verse 12 of our gospel lesson, finally the disciples give it. They finally catch on to what Jesus is saying. And St. Luke tells us, Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. <laughs> Today we don't have Pharisees and Sadducees per se, as in Judaism at that time. But we have modern day Pharisees and Sadducees. Some of them are cults. Some of them are charismatic figures. Some of them are people who have taken Christianity to a point and then mixed it with other things in order to benefit themselves. Some of it is just a totally new philosophy that has been had a, <clears throat> a weak code of Christian language thrown on it in order to convince you to follow. But we listen and must heed the words of Jesus to beware of that level, to stay true to Christ, and to always abide in his word each and every day. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Please turn to page 105 in the front of your worship book.
Again, I invite those who can do so without difficulty to please stand, as with the whole church, we confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. for our offering. You're watching a service, midweek Lenten service, St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We are at the corner of Wittenberg and Columbia. We invite you to come anytime and worship with us. We have services at 8 o'clock every Sunday, 10.30 on Sunday, and 9.15 is our Sunday school. We welcome you to come to hear the gospel, love God, love your neighbor, and don't, uh, as Pastor says, don't let the leaven of the Pharisees corrupt your belief. Come and we'll have your belief purified as you repent, believe, we've confessed our sins, and we have given our profession of faith, which is the Apostles' Creed. This is a midweek Lenten service. St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Our pastor is Pastor John Pollock. As we seek in this Lenten time to grow in our faith, let us pray for the life of the world. Our response this evening is, Lord, have mercy. That the whole church may return to the font this Lent, and through the promises of baptism be found faithful to our citizenship that is in heaven. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. That those preparing for Easter baptism will discover God's ever-widening covenant and embrace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy that the nations find peace this season, that trust be rebuilt and enemies become neighbors, and for the peace of Jerusalem, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That all exiles and refugees find comfort and welcome in the kind embrace of others, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That those who suffer illness of body or mind may receive God's gracious healing, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the leaders of this congregation may serve in in imitation of Christ and faithfully guide us, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That together with all the faithful departed, we may at last find a home in the heavenly Jerusalem. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Grant these prayers, merciful God, and all that we need as we eagerly await the Easter feast through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Um.
May Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless, comfort, strengthen, and keep you now and forever. Amen. 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 We conclude our worship with O Master, Let Me Walk With You, hymn number 818 in the back of your worship. Hymn number 818. service. We love you. We wish that you could be with us in person. Join us here as we do God's work. Listen to him and we help the poor. We help those in need. We love God. We love our neighbor. We can do this because we have repented. We have pledged to Jesus Christ. We've invited him to into our hearts. We invite you to come worship with us anytime. Our services at 8 o'clock Sunday morning, 10.30 Sunday morning, and now during Lent, we have at 5.30 until 6.30 a meal, a fellowship, and after that we have the service. Pastor Pollock is giving meditations on the different parables of Jesus. We heard the one on leaven tonight. We understood what leaven is. We understood what Jesus was saying. This pastor went into depth to explain the things of, that Jesus uh, we have recorded in the uh, Gospels in our Bible. We also, it's important we do one of the things here at the beginning of the service. We confess our sins just as God commands us to do. We confess our sins before others. We invite you to come, repent, confess, believe, love God, love your neighbor. 